Now we're going to talk about non-pharmacological therapies. So psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, behavioral therapies, group and family therapies, stress management, and brain stimulation. So now let's discuss psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and behavioral therapies. Psychoanalysis, which was championed by Freud, is a therapeutic process of assessing unconscious thoughts and feelings and resolving conflict by talking to a psychotherapist. Psychotherapy is talk therapy. Psychodynamic psychotherapy is when a client presents and uses psychoanalytic tools. So in their present state, the therapist would use psychoanalytic tools to help the client. Interpersonal psychotherapy is when they talk about specific problems like communication, grief, relationships. And cognitive therapy is when you think of a situation and you think of the thought that comes before the feelings and actions, and then we change the patient's attitude towards life experiences. And we'll go into depth on cognitive behavioral therapy. There are two things in the gray box that a therapist needs to be aware of. One is transference, transference, and that is feelings that the client developed towards the therapist in relation to similar feelings towards significant persons in the client's early childhood. And countertransference is when the therapist does that to the client. So when we're thinking about Sigmund Freud, not everybody agreed with, with Freud. In behavioral therapy, Pavlov and Watson won the Nobel Prize in 1904 for classical conditioning. And Skinner focused on operant conditioning. So behaviors are learned and have consequences, was an argument. Abnormal behaviors are often an attempt to avoid pain, and changing abnormal behavior can occur without analyzing or understanding the underlying cause. So activities can be taught to individuals to reduce anxiety and avoidant behavior. For example, with test anxiety, they don't need to know the underlying cause to teach techniques such as deep breathing to help reduce anxiety. If we think about modeling and imitation, we can model or role model appropriate behaviors. If you're considering a phobia, you can have systematic desensitization. So if somebody is afraid of spiders, they, get, they could first be exposed to a very small spider. And while that may cause anxiety, they could use and be taught a coping technique to reduce anxiety during that exposure. Flooding is a term to discuss repeated exposure to undesired stimulus. If we're thinking about a token economy, and this works good with oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD or conduct behaviors. These are positive behaviors that we reward with actual tokens that can be exchanged for something. In wartime, individuals were punished for unacceptable behavior and they learned aversion. So if we're thinking about all the different types of therapies, one of the most researched therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy. And Dr. Beck is the father of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a very structured type of therapy, and it's usually short term. It takes 12 to 16 weeks. Individuals start to process their automatic, to be aware of their automatic thoughts, and they pay more attention to their reactions. So to their emotions and their behaviors, and they use Socratic questioning to learn how to be their own therapist. Eventually, they start to focus on cognitive distortions to change the way they think, and they get down to their core beliefs of helpless, unlovable, or worthlessness. So if you're thinking about a tree, in childhood is where we have our roots. And if somebody's roots 
are helpless, unlovable, or worthless, then as the trunk grows, they're going to experience cognitive distortions. An example of a cognitive distortion would be black or white thinking, or where a person thinks everything is good or everything is bad. Or perhaps they focus on everything they do wrong and ignore everything they do right. And then if you think about the branches and the limbs and the leaves, those would be the situation. So when a situation occurs, an individual has an automatic thought. And with that thought comes a feeling and a behavior. But if they can start to analyze the way they're thinking and change those cognitive distortions, they can also change the way they feel and their behaviors. And eventually they can get down to those core beliefs where they no longer feel helpless, unlovable, or worth worthless. So cognitive behavioral therapy is again, structured, it's individualized, short term, 12 to 16 weeks, and it's a one-on-one -on -one type of therapy where individuals work on reframing and modifying automatic thoughts. They question the evidence. What about this is true? They examine other options and alternatives. Is what I'm thinking true? If we think about dialectical behavioral therapy, individuals with borderline personality disorder really benefit from this type of therapy. And Linehan is the expert in this field. It includes mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance, and emotional regulation. And we will talk more about those two types of therapies in class. Here are some short videos on CBT and operant in classical conditioning. So let's talk about Freud and psychoanalytic theory. Sigmund Freud was around 1961 and he identified developmental stages. He also identified three personality structure, structures. So the id, which is impulse or your instinct, ego, this is your rational side, reality and decision making. We'll talk more about ego and defense mechanisms. And the super ego. This is where you can have the perfectionistic principle or internalized ideals like morals and values. So defense mechanisms could be adaptive or maladaptive. Adaptive help you achieve goals and reduce anxiety. An example might be altruism, reaching out to others or helping others who had suffered in the same way. So if an individual has cancer, perhaps once you survive cancer, you volunteer with a cancer organization or sublimation, dealing with unacceptable feelings in a healthy way, like releasing anger at the gym. Maladaptive behaviors interfere with function and when used in excess can damage relationships and even affect your orientation to reality. So defense mechanisms could be adaptive or maladaptive, and the ones I'm going to read could be either. Suppression, voluntarily denying unpleasant thoughts or feelings. Repression, unconsciously putting unacceptable ideas, thoughts, and emotions out of awareness. Regression, sudden use of childlike or primitive behaviors that do not correlate with the person's current developmental level. Displacement, shifting feelings relating to an object, person, or situation to another less threatening object, person, or situation. Reaction formation. Unacceptable feelings or behaviors are controlled or kept out of awareness by overcompensating or demonstrating the opposite behavior of what is felt. Undoing, performing an act to make up for the prior behavior. Rationalization, creating reasonable and acceptable explanations for unacceptable behavior. Dissociation, a disruption in consciousness, memory, identity or perception of the environment that results in compartmentalization of uncomfortable or unpleasant aspects of oneself.
denial, pretending the truth is not reality to manage unpleasant, anxiety-causing thoughts or feelings. Compensation, emphasizing strengths to make up for weaknesses. Identification, conscious or unconscious assumptions of the characteristics of another individual or group. Intellectualization, separation of emotions and logical facts when analyzing or coping with a situation or event. The following stress or defense mechanisms are maladaptive. Conversion, responding to stress through the unconscious development of physical manifestations not caused by a physical illness. Splitting, demonstrating an inability to reconcile negative and positive attributes of self or others into a cohesive image. Projection, attributing one's acceptable thoughts and feelings onto another who does not have them. Let's do a self check. A client has many fearful and angry memories of being beaten, undermined and neglected by her mother. The nurse determines which client statement best represents the use of the defense mechanism of reaction formation. A, I don't like to talk about my relationship with my mother. B, my mother hates me. C, I have a very wonderful mother whom I love very much. D, my mom always loved my sister more than she loved me. The answer is C, I have a very wonderful mother whom I love very much. The client hides her negative, unacceptable feelings by the exaggerated expression of positive feelings. And this is a prime example of defense mechanism reaction formation. When you're going through these slides, you might ask yourself, why do we care about this information? Well, in the late 1800s, psychiatric nursing came about. And nurses realized that they can help people complete tasks they struggle with in certain developmental stages to help them move on to a higher development level and a healthier mental state. Erickson identified eight stages of human development and the ages on the stages of development have kind of changed over time, but the stages have stayed in the same order. So the first one is infancy and that ranges from about zero to 18 months. And this is where the infant develops either trust or mistrust. So is my world safe? In early childhood, when there's toilet training going on, the toddler is trying to figure out, can I do things by myself or do I always need to rely on others? And you will see when you are doing clinicals that some adults do not feel like they are self-sufficient. In preschool, so about ages three to five, the child is deciding, am I good or am I bad? And in school age, they are trying to figure out, how can I be good? Children have to learn how to cope with new social and academic demands. And when they succeed at these, it leads to a sense of competence. If you want to build up a child's self-esteem, help them set small goals that they can achieve. In adolescence, they struggle with who am I and where am I going? So social relationships and young adults, try to discover if they are loved and wanted. So intimacy versus isolation. Now in middle adulthood, people struggle with, am I providing something of value? And that's the stage of generativity versus stagnation. And ego identity versus despair is the final stage. Have I lived a full life? So make sure that you know these stages of development by Erickson. Peplow developed a nursing model with seven subroles for psychiatric nursing. And this nursing model was the framework for interaction with patients. So when we first see a patient, we are strangers. And so we are meeting them for the first time. And then we're a source of information. Next, 
we are in the role of a teacher to help them improve. And then we have a democratic leadership. We work together. Um, sometimes we're a surrogate, whether that's a teacher or they feel like we're more maternal or paternal. And then we're a technical expert. We provide interventions that help them. We also can be a counselor, um, integration and understanding. So these are the seven sub roles that a nurse provides when interacting with a patient. Additional types of non-pharmacological treatments include ECT and TMS. So medications, TMS and ECT all cause changes in neurotransmitter levels and receptors. It also can increase healing proteins, such as brain-derived neurotropic factor, so BD and F. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain with the highest level of abnormal connections and depression. So TMS and ECT are thought to normalize that frontal lobe activity and connect with deeper brain structures. They just do it in different ways. TMS can be used after you failed several antidepressants. It's magnetic stimulation over an area of the brain. You sit in something that looks like a dentist chair and a psychiatrist maps out where the magnets will sit. And then a technician administers the treatment every day, five days a week for I think six weeks. And there are no global seizure, seizures or cognitive dysfunction and few side effects, maybe a headache. Kind of sounds like tapping like a woodpecker. ECT is different. It is the very last resort. And it's the treatment for aggressive or rapidly deteriorating cases of depression. So often these are patients that have suicidal thoughts all the time. Um, they apply direct electrical currents to the patient's head while they are sedated, and they intentionally cause a seizure. The side effects can be big, which is why it's the very last resort, and that includes long-term memory loss.